the other one, you bastard! So it's a brand new year. And of course that means a brand new Transformers line, although things do take quite a bit longer to get released in Australia, so it's pretty late. Last year we got probably one of the best lines in recent memory with Siege. It was hit after hit after hit after hit, as I keep on saying. But the vocal minority were not happy with how it did things. I am of course talking about G1ers, and when they don't like something, they'll be sure to let you know it. So for months and months and months, they staged a plan. I'm not sure if they actually collaborated with each other, but they took to Twitter, they took to Facebook, they took to TFW, and they took to Cybertron, the four locations that they know Hasbro frequently checks so that they could voice their concerns that the toys were not G1 accurate enough. Now, I'm not saying that their efforts were the main contributing factor to the creation of Earthrise, but considering that Hasbro does check those locations, I have a sneaking suspicion it was. So I hope y'all like G1, because for the next 12 months, Generations isn't giving us anything else. With that said, greetings Cybertronians, I'm Dr. Lockdown, and today's diagnosis pertains to WFC E9 Voyager Class Starscream. Funnily enough, Starscream was the most surprising out of the reveals when Earthrise first entered public consciousness, but not for the reasons you'd think. It was less <laughs> and more WHAT?! What the f- At the time, Hasbro had just released seven versions of one of the best Seeker molds in history, so going back and starting from scratch, especially when the trilogy is supposed to be set in space, seemed kinda stupid. But as usually is the case, hindsight is 2020, pun intended. Spent two minutes on any Transformers forum prior to 2020, and the phrase, I wish they remade the classic Seeker mold, but as a Voyager, would jump off the page and punch you in the face. Even then, they'd already done it with the Dark of the Moon version for Studio Series, so the precedent was set well in advance. So, unsurprisingly, Starscream transforms into that jet everyone insists Starscream should be. I know it has a name, but as per usual... Don't care. Still don't care. First, examining Starscream in a vacuum, as his own figure free from any comparison bias, he is pretty good. Often Starscream figures end up going berserk in the light grey and, especially in vehicle mode, barraging your eyes with a dull void of nothingness. Even the older C- oh, uh, wait, we're not doing comparisons yet, I'll save that for later. I'm not typically one to obsess over tune accuracy, but the plastic they chose really makes it feel like he's leapt off the screen and into your lap. Fortunately, the designers weren't smoking the same concoction of various drugs that the Masterpiece guys are currently smoking, so this is balanced by the impeccable detail on display. There's a sh** ton of it here and it all looks gorgeous. I'm sure someone will go and panel line it like I did with my own Studio Series version, but honestly, in this case, I don't really think he needs it. It's also quite fortunate that there aren't that many distracting 5mm ports on the top. Whilst they are the main gimmick of the line, this is one instance that I feel would distract from the main design. That's not to say there are none though, the null rays at the bottom of course use them, and you've got one on the top too. You can also move the back wings aside to access two more, so as far as top facing ports go, it's not atrocious. Besides, the detail is the star of the show, so it does make sense. I do kinda wish the front peg worked though. It's like they intended it to be a 5mm peg, but it's just far too loose. Speaking of detail, the positioning of the Decepticon symbols seems pretty stupid. You've clearly got sections here for the symbols to go, and yet the tapograph design has actively ignored them because the G1 toy had them upside down. I mean, sure, nice job on the stripes, but it falls short at the most important part. Although to be fair, the Siege version did that as well in robot mode. That's all discussing the top section though, which we all know is the easiest element of a jet mode to get right. Pretty much every jet mode on the planet has the same curse. The under kibble. I mean, usually it's understandable, but here, I'm sorry, it just goes too far. Jesus f***ing Christ, it's so th Thick. They've made no attempt to compress it into the torso, and the kneecaps jut out way too far. Usually I have a high tolerance for jet kibble, but this just feels ridiculous, as if the designers did the bare minimum and left it at that. At this point, I have to bring in the original 2006 version for comparison. Well, this isn't quite the original 2006 Starscream. Thrust is literally the only version of this mold I have, and I only bought him as a consolation piece after Mars Toys did a runaway with my hard-earned cash. That's... Not a joke, this really was a grief purchase, and I will never let that company live it down. Everybody betrayed me, I fed up with this world! Regardless, many will claim that being a metaphorical upscale of the classics version, of course these issues are going to be inherited. And yeah, to a certain extent I get that, but honestly the classics version actually did a better job of covering up its bits. That's somewhat disappointing, considering we're at a Voyager price point now and it's been almost 15 years. Time has moved on, but in this regard, Starscream has not. That's not to say there aren't any improvements though, for starters the 
detail on the top massively outclasses the deluxe outing, as it actually looks like plain bits as opposed to hinges and literal garbage. I also really like the way the feet work now. The design is hella sexy, and it's the one element of the design that actually looks slimmer than the original. Also, the top section holds in place, a feat that sadly the original doesn't have to its name. If there was one extra thing I could carry over from the original toy that they left out, though, it would have to be the landing gear. It was such a cool gimmick, but Earthrise Screamer sadly doesn't have any landing gear at all. Bit of a bummer. Still, faults and all, he is a solid figure. Not brilliant, but definitely solid. His chunk also affords him a rather substantial mass, and the plastic density definitely gives him that very swooshable feel. <laughs> Whoosh! 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 <laughs> okay, what the actual f- And then next to Siege Starscream, I have to say they are evenly matched. On one hand, the detail is far more refined and the colours work far better, but on the other, the Tetrajet is a far more interesting design and the kibble management is much better. I know a bunch of people will keep insisting that Earthrise Starscream has better kibble management, but Come on, just... no. Upon first glance, seeing as this is a metaphorical upscaling of the Classics version, not a literal upscaling, they didn't knock it off and upscale it, it might seem identical on first glance, but there are a few small changes that actually make the Earthrise version a smidge more satisfying. But to discuss that, let's get that out of the way. And first off, you want to remove the null rays from the 5mm ports on the bottom. Oh no, weapon parts forming. Yeah, on its own, it's not that big of a deal, but when you bring in the Siege version, it was able to get by without any parts forming at all, so that is a little bit disappointing. But in the end, it is still understandable. I mean, what were you expecting? Masterpiece level engineering with the weird struts there? Nah, that's not gonna happen. When going the other way, you want to make sure everything's really sharply pegged in so these can remain slotted into the sides. But when going this way, you basically just yoink these out and fold them up on there. You'll see there's a peg there and a slot there that you'll have to detach. Now, when these fold up, there's no pegs there to lock them in. I'll go into why this is more of an issue later, but it is a bit of a bummer. Open up the hip skirt to access the legs, and the legs are a little bit different. They've actually swapped out the sliding mechanism on the original for a Combiner Wars leg extension system. And you'll notice there's a peg there and a slot there. Honestly, if done right, and for the most part, these are done right, it is a much better solution because the kind of spring-loaded system there can fail over time, so this is much better for longevity. Also, given the way they click together, you'd think they're not that solid, but they actually kind of are. Collapse the fins, utilize the ankle tilt to untab it from there, and then rotate it down. It may work with that back section like so, it may not. But if it does, you've just saved yourself a lot of trouble. You may have to push it up just a little bit further though, just so it stays in a bit. If these haven't folded up, then make sure you fold them up, and then you also bring the front parts of the feet up. Just like the original, you want to open up this entire torso section. It's locked in really solidly, so you might have to give it a bit of a push. You then open up the arms like so. Thank god it's far wider than the original as well. You get a lot of room to do whatever you want. You then bring the nose cone around, rotate it 180 degrees, then use the double hinge to collapse it into there. And then this will tab into the bottom there. It's actually a little bit difficult to get the chest to line up because there's little tabs and slots on the side here that have to go just perfectly. But when you get everything together, it is rock solid. And at this point, you can bring down the hip skirt. Open up the nose cone and stick it over the back of the head using the double hinge. You then get to the arms, which are somewhat weirdly specific. I don't know why they did it like this, but you actually open it outwards like that. Then use this double hinge to get it out like that. Then collapse and bring the fist down. L like, okay, it's solid and it gets the job done, but... What? I, I don't get it. Jeez, it's so tight as well, though. It's really bloody tight. Then, finally, you bring the wings back like so. And back come the Null Rays into his shoulders. And they actually peg in properly into his shoulders this time, unlike the Siege version. So at least he has that going for him. And in his robot mode, looks-wise, he is... Very, very lovely. There are issues though, which I will get to. In robot mode, Starscream is kinda weird. There's a lot good, a lot annoying, 
and also some baffling choices that don't even make sense when compared to the original toy. As far as the colour layout though, it really does nail the appearance of Screamer. The figure also has an authoritative presence that not many figures from this particular line have exhibited so far. It feels more in line with Siege than Earthrise. Part of that is due to the immensely dense plastic, so even just handling him normally feels good. However, even so, as a display piece, he stands out almost as a centerpiece, lording over the troops, which is somewhat ironic given the type of character traits he's often associated with. The head sculpt is absolutely positively 100% on point, and has easily surpassed even the alternate face on the Siege Incarnation. The choice to use black paint as opposed to black plastic really does wonders for the design, and thank f*** the paint is extremely durable because it's a tight fit inside the nose cone. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said about the red paint. This is the point where I have to start bringing up a lot of minor issues that massively dampen the experience, and in bringing this up, it's going to take a very long time to get through all of them. Now I have to preface this, even when all of these issues are combined, the base figure is still solid enough to be well worth worth the price of admission. But unfortunately, these issues are so numerous that it might seem like I'm bagging on this thing constantly. I just want to say, please understand that these issues are all minor and the overall package is still hella fun. I don't hate the figure by any means, I actually quite like it. That being said, red paint. Looks wise, it's absolutely lovely, but after going through barely any transformations whatsoever, come the f*** on! I get that it's cheaper to use paint than plastic in some instances, but they really should have chosen a more durable paint. It can be done, and there are several examples of durable paint in the main line, but most of them seem to have the common factor of being more of a matte paint than a glossy one. If that's the one sacrifice we have to make in order to avoid this nonsense, I'll happily take it. And yes, I am aware you can add a top coat to it later, but out of the box you shouldn't have to. The toy should just function out of the box. Secondly, whilst I absolutely love the way they've handled the feet, why the actual f*** are the fins attached to the side of them instead of the backs of the legs? In the more extreme poses, it ends up looking bloody ridiculous! The masterpiece version, as flawed as it is, did the much smarter thing by putting it on the backs of the legs. Yes, I might be a little self-centered to compare a $50 Voyager to an over $200 masterpiece figure, although I don't really think it's worth that much, but that method actually involves a much lower piece count, so ironically, the cheaper method is the one they used on the more expensive figure due to its effectiveness. And then there's the artifacts left over from the original Classics toy. Now, no disrespect to the original Classics version at all. For the time, it was a brilliant figure, and in some respects it still is. But seeing how it's 2020, engineering has made enough leaps and bounds to expect a certain level of quality. Yet somehow, amidst all the expertly engineered figures recently, Starscream still gets stuck with a giant goddamn nose cone sticking out the back. This in itself isn't the main problem, as several Seeker figures have done this since. However, those have at least made an attempt to form a cohesive backpack. This blaster thing doesn't even peg in anywhere, it just flops about and juts out the back of the head like it's proud of its laziness. And for those saying, well at least it isn't attached to the head like the original, oh please politely shut the f*** up. Am I supposed to praise the bare minimum of Transformers articulation because the original didn't have it? Again, this is 2020. Certain things are supposed to be expected, so expect, no, demand better. And finally, yeah, the hollowness on the sides of the torso. Now in this instance, I will allow for a little bit of leeway in comparison to the original. It's clear that they've at least made a small effort in covering it up, because the original was Hollow City. That's not to say it isn't bad though, because it definitely is. It's an improvement, but I feel there should have been an extra panel somewhere. Considering my stance on hollow parts is somewhat undefined, here's what I generally think. Hollowness on limbs is fine, if it facilitates a better figure overall, as long as it's only from one angle, and it's only visible from the inward side of the figure, or the back. Through this ideology, I honestly think making the arms hollow as opposed to the chest would have been a better choice. And finally, the wings don't clip in at all. It's clear they wanted to make them peg in at some point, proven by the existence of these slots that don't have any tabs to lock in with, but my guess is it was cut due to budgetary reasons. This is a real bummer, because this kind of solidity would have really put the figure over the edge for me. But as it stands, it's another blemish to add to the pile. But again, I have to reiterate, these issues don't ruin the figure overall. The sheer chunk of chew that only comes across in hand well and truly lets this figure stand as a very nice piece. But the baggage it has really prevents it from being a truly amazing figure. Still, it's not like they could charge a leader price point for him, because that worked so well the last time, and Seekers are designed to be collected, so overcharging never goes well within the community. Besides, seeing how some of the other leaders have turned out, I'm not so confident in the new handling of the side. Wait now, now you just wait one minute, you bastard! Didn't you say you'd stop complaining about toys before they came out? Didn't the cliff jumper thing change yeah, your yeah, mind? Yeah, I know, I know, I even bought cliff jumper. I even ordered on online. But look at it! 
Size-wise, he may seem like a pretty big fella, but in actuality, he's quite a bit shorter than his predecessor. He definitely feels a lot heavier, though. And I'm not just talking about plastic density. This one genuinely feels like it has more plastic overall. Now, as for which figure is better, that's actually a tough one. Earthrise Starscream has the better head sculpt, but Siege Starscream has the light piping, which is always a treat. Earthrise has the better chest sculpt, but Siege's is better painted, not just with the use of more durable paints, but also in the level of paint. Earthrise's null rays look more accurate, but honestly, even with the insane lack of paint, I still prefer the ones Siege used. The detail was just so phenomenal. But for someone who only wants to display their figures in a static A stance pose and never touch them again, Earthrise does seem like the ultimate winner. However, y'all should know that's not how I roll on this channel. And in that logic I have set forth, there is one element that truly seals the fate of this matchup. The head is on a ball joint and gets some pretty decent side to side, as well as some up and down. The arms are on universals, and the biceps swivels, albeit far too tightly. Also, as per usual, the guns get in the way. This on its own isn't an issue, as every Seeker on the planet does this, but I really wish he'd retained his outer forearm mounting ports from the Siege version. It was a really nice option, and to see it vanish in place of an underslung one is a travesty. His elbows may seem like they're double jointed, but in actuality they're only singular. The extra joint is just for transformation and remains locked inside the forearm. It does get you a bit beyond 90 though. Disappointingly, no wrist swivel, and even more disappointingly, no waist swivel. Considering the only War for Cybertron figure deluxe and up that doesn't have a waist swivel so far is Apeface, who may or may not have been a Titans Return carryover, not bothering on what is probably going to be the most repainted figure for the next few years is a grave oversight. At the back, the rings rotate backwards. Sadly, no outward hinge, but the original didn't have it, so whatever. The front skirt is sadly just a single piece, but for a mainline figure, it is fine. And it actually functions properly, allowing for the universal hips to work perfectly forward. Really puts into perspective how bad the hybrid style figure was. Jesus Christ, I can't believe the guy who designed the Macross Valkyrie made this. Unfortunately, the legs don't quite get the full split or any backward motion at all for that matter, but at least the thigh swivels work well enough. It's funny, you'd think the cut would be much further down, but it's actually way up in the waist section. The knees get a bit beyond 90, but you may want to be careful when handling them. On my copy, the right leg has a tendency to fall apart. The left leg is fine though, so I assume I just got bad luck in the QC department. This definitely seems like an individual results may vary type of situation. And if this is the worst QC I've come across in the past few years, I think I've done alright. Finally, you get a 45 degree ankle tilt. It functions as an ankle tilt should, aside from the blatant fins. On his own, as a figure in a vacuum, Starscream has pretty substantial articulation, but when you bring in literally any other War for Cybertron figure, Siege or Earthrise, he quickly starts to seem inadequate. Even f***ing Ironworks, f***ing Ironworks, who hypothetically shouldn't be possible to have a waist swivel on, still manage to figure out how to do one. And then you bring in the Siege version of Starscream, with the bonus double jointed elbows, two points of wing articulation per wing, waist swivel, way better functioning hips that look far more natural than the front skirt on the Earthrise version, knees that go all the way due to the collapsing panel, wrist swivels, wrist hinges, yeah, there's no contest. There's a reason why I specifically worded the phrases a few paragraphs ago as, but for someone who only wants to display their figures in a static A stance pose and never touch them again, Earthrise does seem like the ultimate winner. And yes, when placed in a neutral pose, Earthrise does look better. But if you like to put your figures on a shelf in anything dynamic, Earthrise Screamer just doesn't hold up at all. And that's only factoring in display options. For someone like me who likes to frequently mess with their figures, there's just no contest even further. Siege just takes the cake. Plus, all that aside, Starscream is easily the weakest of the Siege Seekers. Or at least he was until the Rainmakers showed up. Disgusting! Taking Starscream out of the equation, the other Seekers we got are far more beautiful. And quite frankly, I don't think the Earthrise version will be able to surpass them. Honestly, between this and a lot of the recent reveals, I'm starting to think War for Cybertron peaked too early. But even with all of those issues, and even with the lacklustre nature in comparison to Siege, Starscream on his own is still a very nice figure. The jet mode, despite the god-awful kibble, is still lovely from the top. And it really doesn't come across on camera, but the plastic is chunky as hell. The transformation is very enjoyable, possibly slightly more enjoyable than the Siege counterpart, although it isn't as creative. So yes, this mold definitely has won me over in the end, just unfortunately not to the same level that the Siege one has. I'm honestly not interested in collecting a bunch of these, maybe I'll grab a thrust if it comes out to try and heal the wounds that Mars Toys left. If they do an acid storm, I'm always down for an acid storm. And if they make a nacelle, you can be sure as sh** I'm jumping on that pre-order. But deep down, I'm still hoping they continue the Tetra Jets well into the future. And yes, we are getting one of the Netflix ones, so I'm just hoping that sells well enough to warrant even more. Although that is a pipe dream, and more than likely, a ton of people will buy Starscream, he'll fly off the shelves, and we'll see 10 billion of these in the future. But I, for one, will be voting with my wallet.